If you haven't been with us, let me catch you up real quick. This is the final week of this series that we call My Church. Because here's why we call it that. Because there's this line that people cross. And it, maybe you've crossed it at this church. Maybe you crossed it at another church. It's this line where when someone starts talking about the church that you attend, you go, oh, that church, that's, that's my church. Someone refers to church on the hill and you're like, oh, you go there? That's my church. And it has something to do with this belonging that you sense there, this devotion that you have to that church, your commitment to it, your participation with it. Sometimes that statement is not just about devotion, but I'm going to use this word. When you call it my church, there's something about you're willing to make a sacrifice for the mission of that church to move forward. But we realize this, that whenever you call a church my church, there was someone who called it my church long before we ever did. And it was Jesus. He said, on this rock, I will build my church. So we keep asking this question. If I call this church my church, what does Jesus expect of me? It's such a great question. If I call this church my church, then what does Jesus expect of me? Because we realize this, it's not just my church, it's Jesus' church, it's run by his standards. And we can't just call it my church by showing up twice a month, right? I mean, not to be a little blunt, but I'm going to be a little blunt. Some of y'all are like, oh, that's my church. And you call it my church because you attend here twice a month. Let's just be straight. That's not the bar that Jesus set. For anyone who's going to say that's my church, Jesus has some expectations on us. So here's what I want to do. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. I just want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about some people who met Jesus and how their lives were changed and their response to being committed to Jesus. Because before you ever called this church my church, it's not a commitment to each other. It's our response to Jesus. It's our personal response to Jesus. So in Matthew 26, there's this man named Simon who had his own personal medical emergency. At first it began with this tingling in his fingers. And pretty soon he just couldn't seem to grip things the way that he used to. His skin started getting these red, irritating rashes. His skin would peel and flake off. It was a disease that we know today as Hansen's disease. Back then it was known as leprosy. It was difficult because the more that you couldn't feel your hands or your feet, the more you didn't know when you were burning them, cutting them, hurting them. And so as you would damage yourself, this bacteria would create this infection in you, and slowly but surely your limbs would disintegrate. Peel away. And this disease was known 2,000 years ago. And when Simon sees this, you can imagine him covering up his arms and his hands so that no one knew about it. Because this disease was a death sentence. There was no cure for it back then. The worst part about it was it wasn't just a death sentence. It was almost a double death sentence. Because if anyone ever knew that you have it, you were moved into isolation. And if we know anything from 2020, we know what isolation does to people. It is mentally damaging. But it's not like you got isolated and the world was isolated with you. You were isolated by yourself, not in a room, but kicked out of your home. Because when your family saw this, they knew how contagious it was. And you had to live on the outskirts of civilization alone to deal with your disease. That's what this man named Simon was facing. The Bible doesn't tell us a lot of details about his story. It doesn't say how he got leprosy. It doesn't say how Jesus cured him, but based on the story I'm about to tell you, it's assumed that Jesus somehow healed him and changed his life. What we know are two things about him. You ready? Here's the first one. Simon got a nickname. He was known as Simon the leper. Um, can you imagine Simon after he's healed by Jesus, the disciples walking up to him and hugging him and going, Simon, Simon the leper, what's up, bro? <laughs> Only guys can do cruel things like that to each other. You give them a nickname based off of something bad that happened to them. It's just a part of manhood. The second thing we know is his response to Jesus. Simon, he just opened up his home to Jesus. Jesus, you got to come to my place. I mean, how, how can I thank you enough? Come to my house, bring everybody, and we're going to celebrate. 
If you're in Matthew chapter 26, verse 6, this is where this story begins. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper. His story, that's all the details that we have about him right there. (laughs) We don't know how he got infected. We don't know how he got healed. But we just know this, that he had to have Jesus over to his house out of gratitude for the new life that Jesus had given him. His response was this. I'll just categorize it like this. I think I would just say it's just warm hospitality. What I want you to see in the phrase of my church is not just how we've referred to another group of Christians. But when we claim this church is my church, it's intended to be your personal response to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, come and be with me. Jesus, I want you in my house, in my home. We might say things like, you know, I'm inviting Jesus into my life, into my heart. Jesus, I want you to be near me. I want you to be with me. He opens up his heart with, and his home with warm hospitality towards Jesus. Now, listen, I'm just going to say this. This story is an example of how people responded to Jesus. And for some of you, you get this warm hospitality thing. Because out of the gratitude that you have to Jesus, you're like, oh, I will cook. I will open up my home. I want people to come over. I want them to feel cared for. You're like gifted and wired this way. You're like the Martha Stewart of the Christian faith. Because that's how you would say thank you to him. It's just kind of how he made you that way. So if I call this church my church, what does Jesus expect of me? This is just one example, warm hospitality. How can I show my gratitude to Jesus and to the people that gather who claim his name? The next person is this. There's a woman. She really becomes the center of the story as this continues. Here's how it reads, verse 7. A woman came to him with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. Just recognize this. She just made a huge public spectacle of herself. And she doesn't seem to care. Her gift to Jesus is recorded as being very expensive. We will learn later on that this very expensive gift was worth a year's wages. Jesus, reclining at the table, she walks in. She breaks this jar and just starts pouring it down his hair. Starts flowing down his beard. And in that split second, there's a year's wages wasted. Hold on to that. Who was she? We don't actually know who she was. There's theories that she was one of the Marys that followed Jesus around. See, there's a bunch of stories, uh, several different anointings of Jesus that happened, and some people wonder, well, are are those all the same story? And people just wrote about it differently, because in one of those, uh, this, this woman anoints Jesus, but then wets his feet with her tears because of her emotions, and then dries his feet with her hair. I mean, if you've ever read that story. And some people go, well, it's the same scenario, right? It's just people, you know, seeing it differently. You know, the the details are so different that most scholars believe this, that there were multiple times that different women anointed Jesus. So I don't want to major on what we don't know about this text. I want to major on what we do know about it. Here is her response to the life that Jesus gave her. It was extravagant generosity. That's number two. A woman came to him with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, and she pours it all. Now, there's some of you that this really fits how you're wired with God. God has changed your life, saved you. You have such gratitude that you want to give extravagantly. You're good at this. You hear about the two young ladies who are going out onto the mission field, and you're like, wait, they're going out on the mission field, not fully funded? Boom, how much? Let's roll. Like, that would fill you up. Because of how God's wired you. Others of you, you ain't wired that way. You're like, I'll open my home, not my checkbook. (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) Come on, can we have some fun this morning? (laughs) Some of you, though, it thrills you when you get to give extravagantly. It it just, this is part of what fills this, this woman up. And not only that, but she pours it on his head as he's reclining at the table. I want to pick two words to describe it. I just think it's passionate worship. And she comes into the presence of Jesus. It's like she doesn't even care the other men at the table. By the way, in that culture, she's probably not even invited to the table. 
It's probably culturally inappropriate that she steps in and does this thing. Because if she asked, hey, can I approach Jesus? Can I do this to the rabbi? People would have told her no. And she just comes in and just anoints Jesus. She's passionate in her worship. And some of you, you're wired this way. When it comes to praising God, singing to him, or living a life where you verbalize or express yourself, you're an expressive person, and the thing that lives in you, that breathes life into you, the way that you want to respond with gratitude to Jesus, is you just want to just passionately worship him. God bless you. Not everybody in this room is wired that way, but I will say this. I think it's one of the expectations that Jesus has for us, that we passionately worship him. It's interesting because there's a group of people who, um, who criticize her. <laughs> they're, they're the disciples, the men in the room. But Jesus affirms her. He, he says this in verse 10. He, he says, she has done a beautiful thing to me. See, not everybody at the dinner table was comfortable with her gift how she expressed it, how extravagant it was, or this passionate worship. It appears that the men who follow Jesus, if you, if you take a look at this in verse 8, it says, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Can you imagine? Jesus reclining at the table, his hair dripping with perfume running down his beard. He just inhales the sweet smell of this beautiful act. And his disciples go, what a waste. <laughs> oh, I dare you to say it out loud again. <laughs> I dare you to say that to Jesus' face one more time. Because I don't think there's something we could waste on Jesus. You see, four times in the book of Matthew, Jesus predicted his death and his resurrection. And is actually in chapter 26, the same chapter, right up in verse 1, it says that Jesus told them, we are going to Jerusalem. They're not two miles from Jerusalem at this point in Bethany. We're going to Jerusalem, and I will suffer, and I will die. And this woman is like, listen, y'all aren't paying attention. Four times he's told us that he is going to suffer and die and be resurrected. I am anointing him as a, prepare, as a preparation for his burial. The guys just aren't paying attention enough. They don't get it. This gift was fitting because it was a sign of preparing for his death. But here's such an interesting question. Is there too big a gift that we could give Jesus in appreciation for all he's done for us? Is there anything that we could do for him that would be too big and would be a waste? Based off of what we now know. That he claimed he was going to the cross to die on a cross for our sins, die in our place so that we be, could be forgiven and brought into relationship with God and have an eternity with him. But the disciples, they have other ideas about what appreciation looks like, and it's number four here. It's called compassionate justice. I mean, these are men who have been traveling with Jesus for three years, and forgive me for sounding like I'm throwing them under the bus, but these guys had been with him. They had fed poor people, healed sick people. They were out there feeding people, caring for them, and that requires some funding. And they're like, oh my goodness, what we could have done with that money, because we know that you know we're going out to take care of the poor people, we're going out to take care of people, and, and what we could have done with that Here's what's interesting. I still think that this challenge exists not only in this church, but in the church today. That some people in their gratitude and response, they just want to have passionate worship. Others want to have extravagant giving. And others want to go, no, 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 it's all about social justice. It's all about compassionate justice. And it's some, for some reason, they're all followers of Jesus, but they criticize each other because they're not giving in the way that they want it given. We're not expressing our appreciation we're not giving sacrifices in a way that, that we think other people should. Well, it's because you're not her and she's not you. And I think all of these are just very different. And I don't think any of them actually should probably be criticized. Jesus says this in verse 10, aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. 
I just share this story with you to show how three different people all made sacrifices to honor the one who loved them and saved them. They were all grateful. They all loved and followed Jesus, but they all showed their love and sacrifice differently. Warm hospitality, extravagant generosity, passionate worship, and compassionate justice. My point is this. For anyone who will call this church my church, it is not about this community, just about this community. It is not a just about our friendship. It is not just about how we get along with one another. If anyone's going to call this church my church, it's about the community that recognizes that Jesus' sacrifice demands the response of a life lived in sacrifice. If you're going to call this church my church, don't do it just because you feel like you belong. Don't do it because you attend twice a month. Don't do it because your friends go here. Part of this component, and it's the one thing I'm focusing on today, is this. If you're going to call this church my church, you're committing to a life lived in sacrifice to Jesus. What does that sacrifice look like? I, I gave you four of those already. Here's what I'd, I'd like to do. I just want to read through some of these scriptures. I'm not going to doctor them up. I'm not going to make them look fancier than they are. I think sometimes you just have to read the Bible and let the weight of the word of God rest on us. Because I, I think in, in, in moments like this, I think sometimes we set the bar too low for Christians, right? Pastors, we're tempted to do this. What I mean by that is this is, well, if I want people, more people, right? If I want more people, we got to lower the bar so people can come in and like feel like they belong so that more people will call this church my church, right? And we set the bar at John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. So what's the bar? Listen, God did it all. All you got to do is believe and receive, right? You just got to believe in him, receive eternal life. That's the Christian life. Do you realize John 3, 16 is the entrance to the Christian life? It's where it begins. And we never challenge people to get across the starting line. Oh, you got across the starting line. Congratulations, you're in the family. You're good to go for eternity. Kick back. That ain't the gospel. So what, what is the expected response? What does Jesus expect? Let me just read a couple of these to you. The first is this. Jesus expects that your response is going to be a personal response. Romans 3.22, let this rest on you. This righteousness... This innocence that he proclaims over you, this forgiveness he gives you is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. And I can put a lot of other words that separate our society today. Neither black nor white, Republican or Democrat, the divider of that day, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, meaning he paid for us, through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Your personal faith in his act on the cross to call this church my church first this God has to be your God the Christian faith is personal it's a personal relationship it's a personal response to the death of Jesus for you this cannot be your church if he is not first your God now don't get me wrong right if you have yet to cross the line of faith and you're like, I don't know about this whole Christian thing, you're so welcome here. I want you to keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep learning, keep growing in the midst of this. And there's going to be a point in a time where you're going to be challenged as God is going to invite you to cross this line of faith. I just want you to understand, we welcome messy people with messed up lives to discover who Christ is so he can put our lives back together. But we also have to recognize this ridiculous love of God for us. And it's got to be a personal response to him, not just about belonging to each other. What does Jesus expect? A living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, 
What does Jesus expect of us? That you'd be a living sacrifice, not a dead one, not a dying one, but a living one. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Now, I'm a Christian, but this body's mine. I'm going to do whatever I want with it. Nope. You want to say you belong to God's kingdom, God's family, that body that you possess, that he gave you, that he blessed you with, it belongs to him. So ask him, God, what do you want me to do with this? There's a way to use it to care for people. There's a way to use it to love people in a healthy way. There's a healthy way to date with it. There's a healthy way to be married to it. But do we ask God, God, what do you want me to do with this body because it actually belongs to you? What does Jesus expect? Number seven, loving service. Ephesians 5.1, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Show uncommon, exemplary love for each other. Not because of how great they are, but because of how much God loved you. Our commitment is to love messy people like me, who sometimes mess up their lives, and we invite them to become a part of our community. And somewhere in the midst of there, God changes them. Love people that way. What does Jesus expect? I think he expects, number eight, worshipful praise, good deeds, and kind sharing. Hebrews 13 says this. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Isn't that interesting? The word sacrifice is connected with what comes out of our mouth in proclaiming Christ. The fruit of lips that openly profess his name and do not forget to do good and to share with others for with such sacrifices. There's the word again. God is pleased. This word sacrifice keeps coming up again and again as we sing as we talk about him, when we give praise, when we give thanks, he desires that from us and he calls that your sacrifice to him. What does Jesus expect of us, the last thing? Grateful love. 1 John 4.10, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. How we love each other? That's how committed we are to be in my church. If you're going to call this church my church, it's about living with Jesus' expectations of us. A life lived in sacrifice to him. There's a lot of ways that we can live out that sacrifice. But we have to be committed to living this life of sacrifice. Why? Because he made a greater sacrifice than we ever will. Two final thoughts for you as I wrap this up. The first is this. Um, a life of sacrifice is worth it. Let me tell you how I experienced that this week. For my birthday, my wife um, had asked some of my family members to kind of put the word out with some friends uh, people that I've known for years that were involved in our ministry, some in Southern California, some here. Said, so would you write Scott just a letter of appreciation? For my birthday, I got this black folder that as you open it up, is filled with letter after letter after letter of people, some who I haven't seen in 25 years. Some of these letters I got, they were just words of affirmation for me. And I, I, don't, I tell you that because I want you to hear just kind of what I was feeling this week. I only read about three or four of them, and I just had to close it and back away. It was just way too emotional. I was like, oh, okay. Because I'm reading letters of people that 25 years ago, they were in high school, and they showed up in my parents' living room for this Young Life Club. And one girl writes this, the first day I ever showed up, I knew I was home. Man, we sacrificed a lot to try and pull off that kind of stuff. We gave 10 years of our life to Young Life and, and to a, a church down in Southern California. My wife and I were, it was such a fun team. We built a huge team down there of, of college students and adults that just loved on these students. And you just wonder, like, whatever happened to them? Did they stick with it? In this binder, 
It was so interesting. The students I haven't seen in 25 years, it was one letter after another of the same story. Thanks for all you did. It was meaningful in high school. After high school, and then it was just kind of a list of all the things that had gone wrong, all the things that challenged their faith, all the ways that churches had failed them and other believers had failed them. This one gal, she just writes, she said, I knew the faith that you taught us, and I just keep asking this question. Is the messiness of my life, can Jesus, is he enough for it? Is Jesus enough for the messiness of my life? She just remembers, I, she quoted back to me things that I would say, that the Christian life is an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. She said that anchored me to, to Christ. To hear that, that 25 years later, that the effort and the love that you put into somebody, that they're still anchored to Christ. I read another letter, and this person just said, you know what, just, I, I'd given up on church. But I remember what you taught us, that the Christian life was never meant to be lived alone. It was meant to be lived in. See, this church knows what we've been teaching for 25 years down south. And for that reason, this person hasn't given up on church. That folder in those letters, I don't know how long it's going to take me to get through it. But it's like the greatest gift I could ever get from someone in my life. I'm so grateful that Kelly got that for me. I'm just going to tell you this. The life that you live in sacrifice to praise God and love the people around you it is worth it, even if you don't realize it at the time. The last thing is just simply this. It's just weird. <laughs> it's weird to call the way we live life a sacrifice. Like, how can I even use that word? Because it's the same word that described what Jesus did for us. The night before his death, he's at a table with his followers and he takes bread and he breaks it and he says, this is my body that's going to be broken for you. And he takes a glass of wine and he says, this wine is, is my blood that's securing this new covenant for us for the forgiveness of sins. His broken body and his poured out blood on a cross, that's his sacrifice. And he says this, I don't want you to be a dying sacrifice. I want you to be a living sacrifice. Your life of sacrifice, and then you're going to call what I do and how I live a sacrifice. God, it doesn't even compare. And that's the gospel. The gospel is that he's done it for you, so live for him. It's not fair. It's so much generosity poured on you from him. You can never outgive God or out-sacrifice him. Which is why we keep coming back to this table called communion. There's bread on it, and they're just little cups, right? So there's bread on top, and there's juice inside. And we keep coming back to this celebration called communion where we eat the symbol of the body of Christ, and we drink this juice that represents his blood as a reminder of all that he's done for us. And I invite you to do this today. As a church, we're just going to go receive that. The only prerequisite is that you're a follower of Jesus. If you have yet to cross the line of faith and commit your life to following Christ and receive this gift of forgiveness and relationship with him, do it today, right now in this service. What's holding you back from it? It's the greatest gift you'll ever unwrap. And for the rest of us, as we go and receive, and by the way, if you do that today in this service, don't let it be anonymous. Tell us about it. Send me an email. Tell someone you came with today. But if you do that, you're welcome to join us and eat and drink in remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ. For those of us that we've crossed this line of faith, we're going to open the tables up. There's tables in the balcony and on the sides and in the back. To have this moment where we remember his sacrifice. And I pray it would inspire you to live a life of sacrifice in return. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Ah, Jesus, I... When I say the words thank you, it just feels like it is not enough. It feels small compared to the big gift that you gave us. But God, here's our desire. We want to live lives in sacrifice to you. But the truth is we fall short of this all the time. Remind us as we eat and drink that forgiveness wasn't just that one time. God, we live in constant 
forgiveness in constant need of your grace. So God, if there's anybody here today that they feel that their life is too messy for Jesus, grab a hold of them, God, and shake them up and love them. Hug them, God. Remind them that you want them. And there's no sin so great that can keep us from you. And that all we can do is just receive this gift of relationship and forgiveness. And so we receive it, God. We want to commit ourselves to this. From this day forward, we're going to live lives in sacrifice to you. We're going to live lives in sacrifice to you. Whatever that looks like. We're going to ask what you want from us. And we gladly give it. Because you've given us forgiveness, new life, eternity, relationship with you. Thank you, God. And if you're agreeing with that, would you simply say, amen. Feel free to receive communion and enjoy that. Be with God.